Okay, welcome to the fall 2022 session of the Hottest Talks. Uh, this fall, we're focusing on talks by junior researchers, and every two weeks we'll meet and we'll have two 30-minute talks. Uh, the first talk today is by Emilia Liao, who will speak about univalent category theory. Please go ahead. Amelia? Oh, sorry, hardware muted. There was a plane going by. OK. <laughs> yeah, my apologies for that. Uh, I'm going to talk today about univalent category theory. Just to give an introduction to the subject. Uh, I wanted to talk about this in the summer school, but obviously, we didn't have time. <laughs> it was already packed as is. Um, so I'm not going to present anything new research-wise, just give an overview of the field. and. Hopefully make the story natural enough that if you wanted to do category theory and homotopy type theory, you'd end up at the same place, right? Uh, make sure that it's a, it's a natural idea. So a good place to start is at the very beginning. What is a category? So a category has a collection of objects C. For each pair of objects, a collection of morphisms um, of C from X to Y. And we're leaving the word collection fuzzy because that's like the whole point. <laughs> and of course, we have identities, composition, left and right unit, and associativity. And so the question becomes, what is a collection? And since we're doing type theory, a good attempt would be to say that a collection is a type. So a, a category has a type of objects, ob, and for each pair of objects in ob of C, a type of morphisms, hom, from x to y. Um, the identities and composites become dependent functions. The left and right unit becomes paths. Uh, left, right unit laws and associativity become paths in this space of morphisms. And so this kind of works. Like, it looks like a category, but it doesn't really work. Uh, if, you wanna, if you have one of these categories and you don't want to take the slice over an object, uh, you, what you find is that you can define the type of objects, you can define the type of morphisms, you can define identities and composition, but when you start to prove the laws, uh, it kind of breaks down. Specifically, if you want to prove the left identity law, you have to show, you, after some path manipulation, you have to show that this triangle commutes. Uh, and nothing in the definition of categories uh, indicates that this triangle commutes. Uh, and in fact, if you go on the N lab and look up by category, you'll see that they specifically require this exact triangle to commute, right? So if we have a type of morphisms, and the laws, instead of being property, they're structure on your category. And so when you have a coherence problem like this, it's not automatically solved, right? You would have to go in the definition of category and say, oh, you also need this triangle to commute. And for associativity in the slice, you'll need a pentagon to commute. Uh, and for the other unit law, you have to show the, the converse of this triangle commutes, so to speak. But then you'd have another problem because now you have to show the triangle identities and the the pentagon identity in the slice, and those will have their own coherences, and so on and so forth. And we still don't know how to encode infinite towers of data. So the solution here is to say that a category has a set of morphisms. This way, this triangle automatically commutes because it's a triangle of paths in a set. And so by definition, parallel paths in a set are all equal. Uh, and so when you're proving if your category has a set of morphisms, if you're proving identity between morphisms, it doesn't matter how you do it. In fact, in the one lab, we mostly leave them abstract so that a term exists, but you can't see which term it is. Because like, by the definition of category, what terms those are don't matter. But now there's another problem. And this problem is a bit more fundamental. When you encode the notion of category into a foundational system, in this case, type theory, there's extra baggage in the, that encoding which wasn't there. Right? If you analyze the definition of category, it says that we need identity for morphisms. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about identity for objects. 
But just by virtue of encoding the space of objects as, well, a space, now we have these identity types. And the same thing were to, uh, would happen if we had encoded categories into sets, into set theory, right? Now our objects have equality, which is the equality of their encoding as sets, which isn't a categorical notion. It has nothing to do with the category that you're building. It's just an artifact of having to encode that category into objects provided by your foundational system, so to speak, which all have a notion of sameness. Uh, we have a question, how does this compare with Agda categories? So Agda categories takes the solution that I'm going to present right now, which is to do as the see no evil monkey, cover your eyes, and pretend that there is no identity of objects, and you just never speak about it. Uh, but this solution is a bit unsatisfactory, if you ask me. Um, of course, it's the best solution that we have if the identity of objects is something out of our control, but in homotopy type theory, why not take the collection of objects to be a set as well? That's a good question. So by taking the collection of objects to be a set, we would say that any two objects are identified in at most one way. And that excludes, in homotopy type theory, a bunch of categories of interest, um, like every category of stuff, so to speak. So sets, groups, rings, monoids, all of that we can prove uh, in homotopy type theory that they're more than a set, so to speak. And not in the sense of size, not in the sense that the collection is too big to be a legitimate object, but in the sense that you have multiple identifications between points. The canonical example is the set bool, which is identified to itself in two ways. Right? Uh, and uh, getting, where was I? Right. So in homotopy type theory, rather than pretending that we don't see the equality, what we can do, or sorry, the identity on objects, what we can do is uh, we can do a bit better. So we call the data that we had before, object, tom, identity, composition, and laws, a pre-category. Uh, Pre-categories are the pretend they don't exist solution to identity of object, right? So if you have a pre-category, you can talk about the identity of objects, but you shouldn't, right? That's extra data that you have, but you shouldn't have. But there's no way of forbidding you from having it. But a better, um, a better idea is to, we define category or univalent category or even more data, AKS category after the people who introduced them, Arendt, Kapolki, and Shulman, as a category C equipped with this data. For each object C, the space of objects isomorphic, sorry, for each object X, the space of objects equipped with an iso to X has to be contractible. Uh, and so, this condition may sound a bit nonsensical. There's categorical motivation for it. So uh, take some category or a pre-category uh, and an object in it. Consider the slice in that category and the restrict your attention to the isomorphisms. So the objects of the category you're looking at are pairs of an object and an iso to x, the externally fixed object. Uh, this is uh, contractible. It's a group point. And it's contractible. The unique functor into the terminal category has an inverse, which picks out the object x and the identity isomorphism. And by definition of this category, all other objects are equipped with an isomorphism to that single object. Right? Uh, you have to check that the isomorphisms. Uh, this sorry. This proves that the object components are isomorphic. You still have to prove that the morphisms are. Uh, Tend to do the same thing by the inverse, so to speak. But that's a straightforward calculation. Leave it as an exercise. And so why we would do this is that it's super useful. In a un the, the slogan that I came up with is that in a univalent category, is essentially, is essentially is. So if you have something that says A is essentially B, you can just read that as A is B. So as an example, uniqueness of limits. We know that limits in uh, a pre-category are essentially unique. Uh, if you have two limits for the same diagram, there is a unique isomorphism between their, uh, the object that commutes with all of the arrows. But in a univalent category, limits are just straight up unique. If you have 
a diagram of shape J in your category C, the space of limits lim of D is a proposition. Either there is a limit or there isn't a limit. Uh, and if there is, um, the identities between those limits are also propositions, right? Because a proposition is a set and so on. So not only is there a unique limit, but the identities between limits are themselves unique uh, for as many levels of identity between that you want to speak there. Uh, another, um, another thing that works, more, works smoother in univalent category theory is uh, this classical theorem. Uh, if you have a fully faithful functor, which is also essentially surjective, uh, it's an equivalence of category. In set theory, this is equivalent to choice. But if we take category to mean univalent category, then this is just provable. Uh, and the, the reason that this is just provable is that FF and essentially surjective are the categorical analogs of embedding and surjective, so to speak. So a fully faithful functor has subsingleton essential fibers. Um, you can look that up on the end lab, but it's essentially the fiber of the functor. Uh, it, in, 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 uh, to, to, be, to be clear, if your categories are univalent, the essential fibers are just the fibers of the, the object mapping, the, like the, the literal type theoretic fiber of the function. So a fully faithful functor has subsingleton fibers. An essentially surjective functor has, has inhabited fibers. So if you have both subsingleton and inhabited, you have contractible fibers, and we know that contractible fibers means equivalence. Uh, another reason that it's useful is that univalence for categories is an instance of this more general framework for um, characterizing the identity, uh, the identity types of other types. And they say that some space is contractible, right? Some space of objects equipped with a relation, which in this case is isomorphism, is contractible. And so by virtue of having this characterization, we have uh, induction in the sense of path induction for isomorphisms. If you have some property P of every iso in your category, as long as one endpoint is free, it suffices to prove that for the identity isomorphism. And there is a quick proof there. Since the space of objects equipped with ISOs is contractible, if you have a proof for the center of contraction, it extends to the whole space. And we'll see a, a, a use of this in the last slide. Um, so univalence for categories is nice, but it doesn't really cover everything, right? There's more to category theory than just category. And so as an example, um, I'm going to introduce displayed categories, which are my favorite thing to talk about recently. In fact, I wanted to make this talk about them, but by the time I decided that, it was too late. The, uh, the, the data of a displayed category is, is basically a family of categories, but not necessarily a family. That doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. But um, a displayed category E over some base category B has, for every object in the base, a space ob over x of displayed objects, or objects over, if you prefer. And for every morphism in the base, you have morphisms over that. So the, the idea is that a displayed category is a category of structures that you're building on top of your category B. And we have dependent functions for the identities and the composition, right? Uh, and since this notation with all the square brackets is a bit clunky, we have this, these conventions to, to abbreviate them. The, the reason that displayed categories are useful is that they turn into definitional equalities, stuff that would involve equality of objects. And since definitional equality is handled automatic by, uh, automatically by your proof assistant, they are very easy to work with compared to doing all this stuff in terms of functors. Um, so uh, we say that a uh, displayed category encodes the slice of the pre-category, sorry, the pre-by-category of pre-categories over your base. And I messed up the font there. That should have been a cursive B. Uh, displayed categories can also be made univalent. And they can be done. They do so in a much simpler way than just doing it for a category straight up. So we have these equivalent characterizations, which are easy, but I'm not going to talk about them too much. Uh, an, an example of this is in the homotopy type theory book, section 
eight, I think, on the structure identity principle. That data is exactly a displayed category, which happens to be univalent. And so if you have, for example, the category of sets, and you already know that it's univalent, if you want to build the category of groups and prove that it's univalent, if you do it in a displayed manner, it's a lot easier than proving that identity of groups is isomorphism of groups. Because um, a big part of it has already been handled for you by the, the category of sets that underlies the category of groups. Uh, and if any of um, the, the, these characterizations are they're kind of nonsensical if you just look at them, but they are a lot easier. For, so if you, you have the category of groups displayed over the category of sets, for example, each fiber would be groups with the same carrier. Uh, like say, groups with the same underlying set, so to speak. Uh, and then all you have to do is to show that if the identity preserves multiplication, then the multiplication is the same. But that's by definition, right? So you, you automatically get univalence for groups in terms of univalent for sets, if you do like this. Uh, and if any of these hold, we call the, the thing a displayed category. And it's an object in the slice of legitimate univalent categories. Uh, and the, the reason that univalence here is useful is that if you have a notion of structure, of families of structures over some base category, you really want it to respect isomorphism, right? If you have isomorphic objects in the base, you want some way to transfer the structure between isomorphic objects. Uh, and if your base category is univalent, then this is automatic, right? Because by isoj, so to speak, uh, I think that's what I call the theorem, right? By induction for isomorphisms in the base categories, to do something for all isos, it suffices to do it for the identity. But the identity map is automatically the kind of structure that we need. And the, the, the details don't really matter here. Um, it just, re reducing things to the identity is easy because the identity is very well behaved. So everywhere that you see a proof by path induction, you, just, you go, oh, this is too easy. Uh, in a univalent category, you can do that for isomorphisms too. And yes, it is too easy, but it does all work out. Uh, and so there, there has been some more recent work on this. Uh, and so Aaron's and collaborators in 2019 extended the notion of univalent category to univalent by categories. And they proved that the, the collection of all univalent categories, uh, sorry, I got confused there, too, too many univalents. They proved that the bicategory of univalent categories is itself univalent. So categories are identified if and only if there is an, a joint equivalence between them. Actually, if and only if isn't a good word to use there. The identities of categories are equivalent to the adjoint equivalences of categories. There, that's better. Uh, in the one lab, we're working on displayed univalent allegories. So an allegory is an abstraction of the category of relations. Uh, and some future work, if any of this hastily written introduction interests you, uh, is to follow up on the Hotbook's tiny, tiny section on dagger categories, which despite being there, nobody cares about it. <laughs> and so there has been essentially zero work on, on univalent dagger categories in the, what, nine years since the book was published? Uh, and that essentially is an actual essential. I'm sure there was some work. I just didn't find anything to include here. Uh, and I finished with a conjecture, which is that every naturally occurring variety of pre-category, and so that's, that includes categories, dagger categories, obviously groupoids, n categories for any n, including n groupoids, uh, dagger categories, allegories, anything that you look at and say, oh, this is a kind of category can be profitably split into the pre-version and the univalent version. Um, and right, that's, that's all that I have to say. I know that wasn't very organized, so please, questions. Oh, actually, I wanted to answer Henry's question about how does this compare to Agatha categories? Uh, and so they can't say this holds because they're working in a system that's uh, independent of univalence, so to speak. They don't assume univalence, but they don't assume K either. Um, so they are, in a sense, confined to doing the pretend you don't see the identity of objects. The difference is that in Agda category, since they also don't have quotients, they work with setoids for the morphisms. 
Uh, if you wanted to, you could have univalent categories with setoids for the morphisms, but uh, it's easier to just take a quotient. So the, the setoid goes away. I, I hope that answers the question. Now, please, questions. Okay, well, let's thank Amelia. So we do silent applause, visual applause, or you can use the reactions to, to applaud or the chat. Okay, and yes, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, Does this please. suggest that putting knowledge per presentation and by categories of information, putting in categories would be nice? I'm not familiar with that paper. I will take a quick look, but. Um, it's it's um it's what well, it's it's showing it's it's taking um Spivak's work from um, uh, functors from uh, small categories to set as representing databases, moving it to um, by categories of relations with um, symmetric monoidal categories, and it's a by category, and that's the category that's the closest that I've seen to RDF. So, mm. and I would kind of like think, oh, well, it'd be nice to if I could prove things with it. And since you're saying that um, you've been speaking about uh, by categories a lot, then it sounds like this might be uh, a nice place to work on. Right. So I, I found that the that univalent foundations is kind of like the smoothest setting for implementing higher category theory. Like if you just want to do one category theory, then doing it in like lean or in base agda as agda categories do works but for higher categories it becomes really useful to be able to phrase coherences in terms of like coherences of paths because we already have good tools for dealing with paths right uh, and so in a by category in a univalent by category the coherence like the the, the pentagon the triangle identities uh, those become coherences of paths that we can attack using the same tools that we use to attack um, synthetic homotopy theory problems with. So I conjecture that, yes, it would be smoother to, to work with, um, with, sorry, with these by categories of relations uh, in the univalent setting, but it's something that I have to investigate. And... In a sense, we do kind of have some bicategories of relations in uh, implementing some allegories uh, in the one lab, but nothing too fancy. And like they're limited to locally possessed case. Okay, I see someone in Torsten's group has a question. Click, yeah. Yeah, hello, it's me. Uh, okay, on okay. <laughs> Uh, ah, yeah, my, yeah. Uh, sorry, a very nice uh, uh, talk. Thank you very much. I, I just thought uh, I, I was recently giving a, um, a lecture series on category theory, and I didn't really want to first to introduce type theory. So I, 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 I chose this agnostic approach, uh, which is really what you what you said in the beginning, uh, what's called a pre-category, but I just call them categories. So, so mm -hmm. I say. We have types and we have sets, and sets have have an equality, which is a proposition. And so right. I never talk about equality of, of types. Yeah, and and most of category basic category theory can do like this. I mean, obviously you don't have a category of categories, but that's a bit of a lie anyway. So right. So I, I think it's a it's, it's for me it's a good way to to like introduce. I mean, as I say, in an agnostic way to talk about category theory. Which, which is applicable both to somebody with a set theoretic background and with a type theoretic one. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 the agnostic approach does work very smoothly. Uh, and even though I'm here doing propaganda for univalent categories, if you look at the one lab, which has like 70,000 lines of category theory formalized, most of it works for arbitrary by category. But sometimes you have something phrased for a specific pullback and you need to transport to another pullback and doing it by hand would be super annoying. Uh, and in that, in those cases, that's where it kind of like, you go, oh yeah, I'm glad that I made everything univalent. Because in that case, you could just transport um, and like literally yeah. transport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so thinking about the ACTA, the ACTA uh, stuff, is, is there not a version of ACTA categories using a sort of cubical type theory, or is there only one with setoids? Uh, in, in a sense, the, the one lab, my formalization project, 
ended up kind of becoming a version mm -hmm. of Agda categories that's all univalent. It started out as a way for me to introduce type theory to people, but now it's mostly category theory. So okay. good. good. Maybe I'll can uh, I can write it out in the chat the URL. It's all online. It's open source, just like I. Okay. okay. Any yeah. further questions? Okay, let's thank Amelia again. Ah, okay, Chris made it. Yeah, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now.